Well, hello, Jeff Rowe. You said you weren't going to be here till later. Good to see you, brother. Hello, Charles Clark. Hello, sweetheart, Danielle. Hello, Jean. Hi, Sarah. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning, Sally. Bobby B. Avenue, my old buddy from way back in the day. Miss Flores, good to see you. Good morning, Terry. Hello, Jackie Gale. Good morning from California, Denise Garcia. Well, I'm I'm good morning from Texas, but you knew that. Good morning, Colleen. Good morning, Annette. Good morning, Betty. Hello, Ann Sharp. Well, good morning, Judy. And I, I guess Conrad's there with you. Jeannie Howard. Jan and Clint Silverthorne, good to see you. Marcel, good to see you this morning. Oh, well, that was very sweet of you, Jeff. Glad that you uh, came on and got in here with us. I'm going to try to share this right now on my page. There we go. Maybe that worked. <clears throat> um, anybody else having sound problems? Judy seems to be having sound problems. Good morning, Katerina. Gail and Danny, good to see you this morning. Morning, Dwayne. Y'all are still at Beaver's Bend. Larry and Deborah, good morning. Just open the door and all your friends come in. That's awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Marcel. All right, people are coming in. Okay, sound is sound is good, Barbara. What? Your daddy's on. Oh, hello, Daddy. I just saw his name come up. Good morning, Dad and Diane. Good. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, George. Been praying for you. We have had a morning. I'm telling you what. And I know why. Dorinda, uh, Dorinda reminded me of why we were having uh, issues. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, Sonia. I was I was wondering why we were having all these issues, and boy, there's been a lot of issues this morning just getting here, getting ready to go. <clears throat> and she reminded me it's because of the subject matter of today. Good morning, Valinda. So I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm sipping on my third cup of coffee today. Anybody else had a, had a cup of Java? Uh, it's a three cup morning. Good morning, Mary and Dick. Good to have you with us. Shelly and Scott, good morning. Good to see you guys. Katrina and Tom. Katrina and Tom Burton, good to see you. All right, give us your prayer requests if you want us to pray for you, and I don't know why you wouldn't. Um, we certainly want to pray for you, so if there's something that you can share with us, uh, we'd be happy to, to uh, pray for you. If it's of a personal or private matter, you can message us here on Perry Phrase. And uh, good morning, Janie. <clears throat> so we've been seeing a lot of answers to prayer. But, you know, prayer is more than just getting answers from God. Um, it, it, it's, it's more than just trying to get him to provide for our needs. Coffee and spark. I don't know what that means. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of something added to the coffee. Good morning, Dan, David, and Linda. But, you know, prayer is... Yeah, we we do have the privilege of, of asking God to, to meet our needs, but we also just get to spend time with him and uh, just listening and leaning in on him. Being with him <clears throat> is incredible. So we encourage you to spend more time um, with, with him this week. We have some friends of the Clevelands that are there with us today too. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. Uh, as you join us, uh, continue to let us know you're here. Good morning. Thank you, Dottie and Bob. Thanks for letting us know you're here. Everybody else, just let us know you're here. And there's Conrad. <clears throat> um, you also, 
you know, one of the things we really miss about not meeting together with our church family is hugs. Um, and so if you've, I think there is an emoji that is kind of a hug emoji. It's the one with the little yellow dude wrapping his arms around a heart. So if you want to give some hugs out right now, uh, that would be, that would be great. There you go. Good. Welcome to Perry Phrase. My name is Perry, and I enjoy phrasing words in such a way that connects God's Word to everyday life using everyday language. Love seeing all those hugs. That's awesome. Lots of hugs going around. Everybody grab a hug because one of them's for you, okay? God's Word is aimed at the good soil in your heart. And so what we try to do is uh, present God's Word in a way that's easy to understand. Um you know, in these days, we are hearing a lot of new phrases. Um, 2020 has brought some interesting new phrases into our everyday vocabulary. I'm not going to mention the obvious ones, because if you're like me, you're sick and tired of hearing them. But one of the new phrases that I keep hearing or I keep seeing all the time is the new normal or the next normal. And it, can I just be honest? That is a repulsive thought to my spirit. <laughs> I can't even process the thought of all this craziness becoming normal. It just, I don't want this to be normal. I want this to go away so that we can be who we were created to be as social creatures. When the abnormal becomes normal, it normally means that we've settled for the subnormal. Let me say that again. When the abnormal becomes normal, it normally means we've settled for the subnormal. God's Word calls us to a life beyond normal, beyond the ordinary to the extraordinary, beyond the natural to the supernatural, above the chaos and confusion, to a life of peace and peaceful perspective. Uh, if this is your first time with us, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We've saved a seat for you, just for you. Got your name on it. And we've prayed for you. We've prayed for you to find your way here. We hope you'll stay. We always ask people just to give us at least three minutes. And if you don't have three minutes now, um, come back to the Perry Phrase page later and, and watch this video or, or, or some others that are there. Uh, I really believe there's at least one that is specifically meant for you. Don't ask me how that works. That's above my pay grade. You just have to ask my boss. Somehow God is able to pull that off. It's not me. And I know that I know that we're not for everyone. Um, sometimes the connection between two human hearts just isn't there. Again, only God knows why. But if you are connected, if you if you are blessed by what you hear on this paraphrase page. Uh, if, if your heart gets connected to our ministry, just let us know. Please let us know because it's very encouraging to us. We would love for you to, uh, to become um, just one of our consistent uh, friends here uh, every Sunday and even join us on Tuesdays at 7. Uh, we love it when you become our publicity agents by sharing the Perry Phrase page with others on your page. We're really humbled and blessed by those who have joined us on this unique journey. Uh, almost every day, <clears throat> we open our mailbox at the end of our driveway and we receive heartwarming, encouraging messages of love and support from you folks. It melts our hearts. It brings tears of joy to our eyes. We, we, can't, uh, we just can't express to you how much it means for us when we open that mailbox and we see we've got a card or a letter or just something from, from you folks that are, that are in this journey with us. And we praise God for you, and we thank God for you. Uh, some of you may not have our mailing address. We'll be happy to share that with you if, if that's something you want. We're not asking for that. We're just, we're just, I'm just wanting to, to just kind of share a little bit of the overflow of how God's blessing through this ministry. Um, last Tuesday night was a little bit different. I came to you from my truck. I was parked at a state park office in Arkansas. Millwood State Park, and I had to park right up against the State Park office building. Thankfully, they were closed. Um, that was the only place I could find Wi-Fi, 
and I half expected the park ranger to pull up next to me while I was teaching. In fact, I almost hoped that he would have because I would love to have seen his reaction when I told him, I'm just having Bible study in my truck with a few friends. I bet he's never heard that one before, right? Well, we're back home. Today we're coming to you from where we normally come to you from, and that's from Coke, Texas, the home of our awesome friends, Dan and Jan Skinner. And uh, we 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 have a, a lot of different reasons why we why we come here. One is just they are such amazing friends. Also, we don't have internet at home, so we borrow theirs almost every week. And then they feed us lunch, which is a pretty good deal right there, right? But no, they truly are great people. And <clears throat> I've had uh, multiple requests from you to have Dan play his guitar again. So Dan is going to do that at the end of our of our message. Um, he's going to play a familiar song that goes with today's message. All right, so are y'all ready to get started? All right, good morning. May the grace, peace, joy, and blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ rest on you as you engage your mind, body, and spirit on the Word of God today. So let's, let's have church. And today we're going to call ourselves Cyberspace Fellowship. Cyberspace Fellowship where virtually anyone can feel at home virtually and literally because you are at home. Today's message is from the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 through 15. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews is in the New Testament. Uh, it's toward, kind of toward the back. And if you find the book of Revelation, just take a left and you'll, you'll pass a few little books and then you'll get to a big book named Hebrews it's Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 through 15. Now, as you may already know, the title of today's message is Life Is. Now, when you have a subject as broad as life, you can expect there's going to be a lot to say about it. So knowing that, I only intend to begin this journey together today. I can see this as being at least a three-week series, all right? So... So don't, don't worry. We're, we're going to talk about life, but we're going to break it up into three, at least three sections. The book of Hebrews. Uh, it's not about a man who makes coffee, but I'm, it's an amazing book about the superiority of Jesus Christ over everything. When you read the book of Hebrews, you see that, that he's talking about, the writer of Hebrews is talking about Jesus being superior to angels, superior to man, superior to the temple, superior to the priests, superior to all things. And so one of the ways that the writer of Hebrews points out Jesus' superiority is in relationship to the Old Covenant and the way the Old Testament instructed God's people to interact with God. Specifically, the Old Testament system of sacrificing animals in a temple by a priest for the purpose of an annual atonement uh, that's contrasted by the eternal life-giving power of Jesus' shed blood on the cross. It's a contrast between a restrictive religion and a redemptive relationship. Another way to put it is there's a shadow here, but it's a shadow in reverse. What do I mean by that? Normally a shadow follows or appears behind the object. But God gave us the shadow of his plan of salvation and of his plan of atonement in the Old Testament sacrificial system before he showed us the object, namely the person of his plan of salvation and his plan of atonement in the New Testament. So that sets us up for the first answer that we're going to look at today to the, the life is. Life is... In his blood. Life is in his blood. That's point number one, and this is the point we're going to be on today. Um, this goes all the way back to the book of Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, the fourth book in the Old Testament. Leviticus 17, 11 says, There is life in the blood. Let me just read that verse to you. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, God said that all the way back in the book of Leviticus. 
it's a truth that's true all the way through. It's also a truth that points toward a one-time fulfillment, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, the word atonement means to be brought back together. You can literally divide the word atonement into three sections. At one month. Take the word atonement and you put a couple of little dividing marks in there. At one month. That which was separated is now at one. The idea, though, of believing in a bloody theology has repulsed a lot of people. It, it, it's met with a lot of resistance through the years. Uh, opponents of this view say that it, it runs contrary to the love of God. They, they portray God as only a God of love and say that a God of love would not have planned to shed the blood of his innocent son in order to appease his anger. They just don't think that sounds like a loving God. But, but I say to you what I believe Scripture reveals, that the love of God does not annul or make void the justice of God. The love of God and the justice of God are both essential qualities of his character, and, and, and one doesn't rule out the other. We are sinners, and as such, we stand condemned before a holy God who can have no sin in his presence. So Jesus, of his own free will, took our place and paid for our sin with his own blood. Um, now, this isn't true because I say it's true. It's true because the Bible says it's true. The idea of a blood sacrifice flows throughout the Bible. In fact, it's been said that if you cut the Bible with a knife, no matter where you slice it, it would bleed. The word blood is found over 400 times in the Bible. It appears in the book of Hebrews 21 times. And in these five verses that we're looking at, four times you find the word blood. So starting in verse 11, I want to I want to break this this uh, message today up into four sections. The first one I mentioned the shadow. The first one is the shadow is significant. If you're taking notes, the shadow is significant. Now, you remember what I said about the shadow? The shadow of the Old Testament sacrificial system came first. Then came the reality that actually cast the shadow. Um, you know, it helps to understand the book of Hebrews if you understand a little bit about the Old Testament. Um, if you understand how sin was dealt with under God's instructions uh, in the Old Testament with the children of Israel. So atonement for the sins of the Israelites involved the temple, a high priest, and sacrifices. Specifically, the sacrifices of bulls and goats. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would, would enter a portion of the temple that no one else could enter. It was called the Holy of Holies, or in our text, the Most Holy Place. It's where the presence of God dwelt. And so it was a room divided from all the other places in the temple. And it was there that the priest, once a year, would go in and he would sprinkle the blood of a sacrificed bull and goat on top of the, the lid, the seat of the Ark of the Covenant, known as the mercy seat. All right? So today there's no temple, but the Jews still observe remnants of this Old Testament system. Um, you know, most of us have probably by now thrown away our 2020 calendar, if we had one. But if you happen to keep yours you would see that on September 27th, that's just right around the corner, there's something stamped on your calendar probably that day by the makers of that calendar, and it's called Yom Kippur. And it says that Yom Kippur begins at sundown on September 27th. Well, guess what Yom Kippur is? Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. It's connected all the way back to the Old Testament. It's the one day of the year when the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies to make a sacrifice for his own sins and for the sins of the people for that year. Now, the high priest dared not enter the Holy of Holies without blood. He took the blood of a bull and of a goat and sprinkled them on the mercy seat. First, the blood of the bull 
was sprinkled as an atonement for his own sins. Then the blood of a goat was sprinkled for the sins of the people. Now, this is very, very important to, to grasp. This sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat by the high priest in the temple did not pay off the sin debt. It put off the sin debt. All right, let me say that again. This sprinkling didn't pay off the debt. It put off the debt. The sins weren't forgiven. They were only covered. It was like a poor man's attempt to pay off a rich man's debt. One dollar a year applied to a million dollar debt with interest that rose each year. So you get, kind of get the picture. And the debt continued to rise throughout Israel's history and, and man's history. And all this time, a payday was coming. But God had a plan, and we're going to talk about that plan. That plan involved a heaven temple and a high priest who not only entered the Holy of Holies to present the sacrifice, he became the sacrifice. His name is Jesus. Look at verse 11 and 12. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle or temple not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place, the holy of holies, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Jesus is both the high priest who enters where we cannot go into the presence of a holy God, and he's the sacrificial lamb who voluntarily shed his blood, not just to cover our sins, but to pay for our sins. Notice it says, having obtained eternal redemption. The word obtained means he bought it, and to redeem is something that you pay off. So Jesus paid off our sin debt for all eternity when he died on the cross. So yes, the shadow is very significant in helping us understand what the writer of Hebrews is telling us about Jesus entering the most holy place and redeeming us with his own blood. Now understand that, that what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is symbolic. Jesus didn't actually go into a heaven temple and sprinkle his own blood on a heavenly mercy seat, but he accomplished the same idea when he willingly died on the cross. Verse 13 begins the second part. The second part. Not only is the shadow significant, sin is still in. Sin is still in. You say, well, yeah, sin's always been in. Everybody likes to sin. It's always been the end thing to do. That's not what I mean by that. I'm going to explain to you, but first let me read verse 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, in other words, pure, cleanse, how, how much more will he cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, here's what I mean when I say sin is still in. Sin is still an inside issue. It's in here. It's a heart problem. You see, the problem with the Old Testament um, way of dealing with sin was it was all external. The, the Old Covenant sacrifices only cleansed the priests and the people ceremonially, outwardly. And this outward cleansing eventually became a source of pride for the Jews. It was already an issue in Jeremiah's day. God spoke through Jeremiah in chapter 2, verse 22, and said, For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity, your sin, is marked before me, says the Lord God. And by the time Jesus arrived, nothing had changed. In fact, it had only continued and gotten worse. They were more concerned with outward displays of purity and had no concern for inner purity. In fact, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees over and over again over this very issue. Let me give you an example. In Luke chapter 11, verse 39 and 40, Jesus said, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, 
but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? You see, merely observing some ritualistic laws was sufficient for external cleansing, but the inside issue was still an issue. Sin was still in, inside them. Notice verse 13 says, it purifies the flesh, the outside. But what Jesus did at the cross purifies the inside. Do you notice in verse 14, cleansing the conscience? Where's the conscience? Conscience is on the inside of us. Listen, I, I'm thankful when people decide to partake in outward cleansing. It's important to bathe, shower, wash your hands, brush your teeth, scrub behind your ears. All of that's great, and I'm glad that we do that, but there's a stain on the inside of us all. Sin is still in. It's still inside of us. And we have the same sin problem now that they had then in the Old Testament. Now, we might be tempted to think we're not sinners. We're not bad sinners. Because we like to compare ourselves to other people. But you know what? When we compare ourselves to others, we're only comparing stains. We're not comparing our stains with God's pure holiness. You see, you, you can compare two white t-shirts that you've had for five years against each other, and they'll look about the same shade of white. And so you look at both of those five-year-old white t-shirts that you've worn through the years, and you look at them and you say, well, they're white, they're clean. They seem clean, but if you took one of them away and then opened a brand new white t-shirt fresh out of the package, you're going to notice a difference. This one's going to be so much cleaner. It's, it's going to make the other one not even look white. You see, God doesn't compare us to each other. He compares us to himself. That's why the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. It doesn't matter how, how, how your sin compares to somebody else's sin. Your sin is still an affront to God. My sin is still an affront to his holiness. Sin is still in, internal, inside of us. And it's a problem for all of us. But there's a solution. A cleansing agent for the sin-stained soul. You know, we used to sing about it all the time growing up in church. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Mm. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Mm. Thank God Jesus provided himself as the Lamb to take away our sins. 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. It's like we become that brand new white t-shirt fresh out of the package all over again. No stains. Now, his blood isn't one option among others. His blood is the only cleansing agent in the world for removing the stain of sin in your soul and mine. There was a woman at a garage sale. She spotted an antique copper kettle and it was priced at $2.50. Now, the copper was badly tarnished, so she took it to the lady that was, that was holding the garage sale, and she asked her if the discoloration on this copper kettle would come out. Well, the nice lady that was running the garage sale cheerfully offered to try some copper cleaner on it, and so she disappeared into the house, and after a while, she came back out, and the kettle looked completely different. It was gleaming. 
And so the lady handed it back to the customer for her to inspect it, and it was absolutely beautiful. She was so excited about it until she realized that the old price tag was gone, and there was a new price tag that read, like new, $10. You see, the kettle itself didn't change, but something changed its value. So what made the kettle more valuable? Just a simple cleaning. And I would say to you, almost everything is more valuable once it's cleaned, including us. So number one, the shadow is significant. Number two, sin is still in. And then the third section, the sin problem caused a separation situation. The sin problem caused a separation situation. The issue of sin is universal. It's everywhere. I mean, look at every problem known to man, every issue we face, every argument you have, every person that you get upset with on Facebook, every story that's in the news. You look at all of it, and you're going to see the stained fingerprints of sin attached to it. But it, but it does more than cause societal and human relationship issues. It causes another problem much bigger than that. Our sin has separated us from God. And if something isn't done about it, that separation will be permanent and eternal. But guess what? Something was done about it. And now that that something was done, there's still something you need to do for it to apply to you personally. And I'm going to talk about that at the end of the message. In that temple we talked about, with the section called the Holy of Holies, or as verse 12 calls it, the most holy place, there was a thick curtain. So you, so you have the temple, and you have uh, an area of the temple where the average Jew could come and pray. And then you have another section where the priests could minister. But then you have another section that's separate from all the rest of it, and it's separated by this, by this thick curtain stood between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple. The curtain went from the very top all the way to the very bottom and covered each side, completely covering the entrance to that room. It was a symbol of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. The people could not be in the same room with God because of their sin. They were separated from God. But have you ever wondered why a curtain? Why did God instruct the children of Israel to put a curtain there instead of a wall? Huh. Because God knew this was temporary. God knew he was going to redecorate. God was sending a message via the curtain to us all that he would one day draw the curtains back. You know, the Bible also calls it a veil. A veil is what brides wore. I don't know if they still do or not, but back in the day, brides always wore a veil, and it was to, to sort of hide her face. But it's the very same symbol. It's a symbol of separation. Did you know that? The man and woman are not to engage in their marital union until they complete the marriage vows. There is a barrier there, and the veil symbolizes that. And in that beautiful moment in a wedding, when the minister says to the groom, you may kiss your bride, the groom lifts the veil to reveal her face and gain access to her lips, but also to symbolically say, you may now become one flesh. There are no more barriers, no more hindrances to this relationship. That's the picture of the veil. And God was saying, by placing the veil or the curtain between his presence and the people, that there's coming a day when there will be no more barriers. There will be no more hindrances to the people coming into the presence of God. There is a groom coming, and he's going to remove the veil. Amen. Hmm. Praise God. You know, going back to the temple for just a moment. Only one man, the high priest, could approach God once a year. And he had to carry blood with him. Jesus, the one and only begotten Son of God, 
became our high priest. And when he went to the cross, picture this. When Jesus went to the cross, he slipped behind the veil to the mercy seat of God. And he shed his own pure blood to pay for our sins and to remove the separation barrier between us and God. And the Bible clearly tells us that when Jesus died on that cross, the curtain, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Well, if it was torn from top to bottom, guess who tore it? God did. And it was a powerful message from God that the sin problem and the separation situation had been resolved. And so we now, all of us, have access to our Creator through the precious blood of Jesus. And that's the fourth part of this message today. It's a rather long part if you're filling in the blanks, so I'll say it slowly and I'll say it twice. The solution... To the sin problem and the separation situation, in other words, the solution to B and C, the solution to the sin problem and the separation situation is a sacrificial Savior. The solution to the sin problem and to the separation situation is a sacrificial Savior. Let me read verse 15 to you. I'm reading from the New King James, but I'm going to read it again from another translation. And for this reason, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So now listen to this from the New Living Translation. That is why Jesus is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under that first covenant. I love that phrase. Christ died to set them free. One translation tossed in a word that's, uh, that's worth thinking about. One translation says, Now that he has died as a ransom, to set them free. Ransom, what a word. What a word picture. And it's a consistent idea, at least in the New Living Translation. Peter wrote in 1 first, first Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Now, generally... When a ransom is paid, it's paid to a bad guy or to a kidnapper. I even heard recently of school districts that are paying ransoms to hackers who've infiltrated their school computer systems and taken hostage all of their school information. And these school systems are paying the ransom to get their information back. Well, look, Jesus didn't pay off a bad guy like the devil. He paid off a bad debt. Remember when I said the sin of the Israelites kept piling up, collecting interest, and their annual sacrifices were like a $1 payment to a million dollar debt? Well, I also said there would be a payday. Well, payday came. Payday came the day Jesus hung on the cross and said, it is finished. Now, I love the word that Jesus used. It's all one word. It is finished. It's all one word in the Greek. It's tetelestai. I love this word because it means it's paid in full. Hallelujah. Jesus paid off the sin debt. All of the sin over all of the time and all of the, of the piling up of interest, all that was owed to God, everything, every red cent of sin, that, that, has de, that has defied the face and person of God was paid for. Jesus said, I've wiped it out. I've paid it all. He settled the debt of our sin. He purchased our redemption using the only currency heaven values, the precious blood of God's Son. You know, the Bible puts a lot of adjectives in front of the blood of Christ. Judas called the blood of Jesus innocent blood. 
Peter called it precious blood. John, in his gospel, called it cleansing blood. In Revelation, John called it washing blood and overcoming blood. Paul, in his many letters, calls it the purchasing blood, the redeeming blood, the justifying blood, the peacemaking blood, and the sanctifying blood. Jesus said his blood is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Wow. I don't mind a, a, a bloody theology because it's the blood of Jesus that was the only thing that could pay my sin debt and Jesus voluntarily and willingly did so because he loves us. Folks, the blood of Jesus is our only hope of salvation. You know, if someone loses all the blood from their body, they die. And if you take the blood out of the gospel you take the life out of the gospel the blood is essential for our salvation not just any blood only the precious blood of Jesus you see the beauty of Christ's payment for our sin is that it not only took care of a past debt issue it has also freed up a future inheritance for us. Every person who refuses or denies Christ faces a horrendous future in hell. God doesn't want that. We don't want that. It's why God went to the lengths that he went to send us his son. It's why Jesus was willing to sacrifice his life for us. He wants us to partake in an inheritance promised to us from the beginning of time. He wants to restore what was lost in the Garden of Eden. Those of us who have chosen to trust and accept Jesus as our Savior, we face a future filled with undeserved blessings. You see, the very end of verse 9 says that those who are saved may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Wow. So it's not just about paying for our past debt. It's about looking forward to the inheritance we're going to receive. Uh, David Dykes told the story about a physician friend of his. Um, when this physician was a young doctor, uh, had his res residency um, in an emergency room situation many years ago, uh, as this young doctor was uh, just beginning his, his, uh, his residency there, a teenage boy was brought to the emergency room in critical condition. Uh, this young teenager had been involved in a terrible automobile accident. The doctors and nurses were doing everything they could to save this young man's life, but it, it didn't look good. Well, the boy's parents arrived in the emergency room, and, and they stood by their son, one on each side of his bed. And the young doctor knew that uh, this boy's parents were separated, had been separated for a couple of years. Divorce was imminent. They hadn't spoken to each other in many, many months. The tension in the room was extremely high, and it was very awkward. But here they were, face to face, on each side of their dying son. Well, the boy was barely conscious and had been intubated, so he couldn't talk. But just before he lost consciousness, this teenage son reached up and took the hand of his father and placed it in the hands of his mother and then he died and you know from that night on the parents were reconciled as husband and wife but oh what it cost for them to be reconciled you see folks that's what Jesus did for us we were separated from God and, and just before Jesus died Jesus took the hand of the father and he reached down and took the hand of sinful humanity and he brought us back together. Then Jesus died. He bridged the gap and set us free. And that's why I say to you today, life is in his blood. Now, next week we're going to see another place where life is. But now really seems like a great time to sing a song about the blood of Jesus. 
I'm going to ask Dan to come and get his guitar. And we're going to sing together. We're going to sing nothing but the blood. And I want you to, I want you to join us. I want you to sing with us. Because we've, we've been able to hear the good news about the blood of Jesus. So now let's sing. Let's celebrate together. Jesus. Thank you, Father. Can I pray for you right now as we finish our time together this morning? Can I pray for you? Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus through the precious blood of Jesus. And we thank you that though we are sinners and our sin has separated us from you, that you loved us so much that you sent your Son into the world to save us save us from our sins, save us from ourselves, and to, to buy us, purchase us with the blood of your son Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for the future inheritance that we have. Thank you for the current indwelling presence of your Holy Spirit that brings us things like love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and meekness and self-control. Father, all of these things are things that you give us now, and we look forward to the things that are coming. Lord, we're living in a, in a strange and unusual time, and I'm sure my friends who are praying with me right now would, would admit that they've, they've got some battles and some struggles. They've got some challenges, some loneliness, some emptiness, some fears, um, just some frustrations, some anxieties, some burdens. And so, God, right now, in the name of Jesus, we lift those up together to you. We place them at the feet of your throne, and we, we let go of them because we trust what you're going to do with them. And we thank you in advance for the good that's going to come out of every one of these. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for the blood and for the cross 
for the empty tomb, and for the heaven that awaits us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you so much. I think Dorinda put our address in there earlier, our mailing address. Um, we really don't want any hate mail. Um, we just want good stuff. <laughs> no, I know, I know better than that. Thank you so much for joining with us today. God bless you. We'll see you Tuesday night. We'll be somewhere. Hopefully you'll be here with us. Love you. God bless.